I'd like to call the meeting to order uh, and welcome our guest, Julie Hauser, is here from the community, and uh, Danica Powell, who will be doing a presentation uh, for us with Trestle Strategy, uh, and also Francie Jackie will be here. Uh, for presentation for Longmont Climate Action. Um, the public is invited to be heard. Julie, do you have anything you'd like to, to say? to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Has any, everyone had the opportunity to read minutes from previous and any changes mm -hmm. or correction? Can you make a comment to that? the format. Um, I have tried hard this time and will continue trying harder to make the minutes simpler and less complicated and just emphasize official action that we take. Because if you want to know about the discussion that does not involve motions and votes, you can go to, right. to the video and see it better. So. I'll put in the minutes just a brief reference to the topic discussed, and if you want more, you can go find it online, wherever. So, okay. I just wanted to explain that because I like I asked, I've written a book. <laughs> <laughs> I, do that I motion that we accept the minutes as written for last meeting. Second. Mm -hmm. So minutes are accepted and seconded. Um. Should we go to our presentation, Michelle? Yeah. There's no reason not to, um, unless the board wants to delay it. You know, we might just add, Janine, that Janine and I met when we were putting together the agenda and decided to put some time references on the agenda just to try and keep things moving and sort of have an understanding of what's to come. So that is an additional kind of new thing on your agenda is some time reference. So. Which is great. I was going to ask how much time I have. Is it about 20 minutes? You have about 25 minutes. 25 minutes. Okay. <laughs> great. So, well, um, my name is Danica Powell. I actually work for, um, I have a consulting firm called Trestle Strategy Group, and I'm based in Boulder, but I work on a lot of different types of community projects throughout the region. And I'm um, working now on this Home Wanted Initiative, which is a really important um, collaboration between the nine jurisdictions. It's um, in the Boulder County, so nine, Longmont, Boulder, Louisville, Med, Jamestown, have all signed on to a regional housing plan, which they, they created a, a plan a couple years ago, and it was a really big deal, I think, to get the jurisdictions to all work together towards affordable housing as a regional goal, not just um, each community working for itself, and so, the goal of the plan is to increase um, so to increase affordable housing um, throughout the region. So currently about 5% of existing houses housing is affordable. And for conversations today, and I think in the community, we really talk affordable housing, you can get into area median incomes and a lot of data, but what really matters is um, cost burden and how much people are paying towards housing. So if you're paying, and you guys look like you know what I'm talking about, so if you're paying more than 30% in your housing costs, you're, you're considered cost burdened. And so what we're really trying to do is increase access to housing for all people. Um, it's an equity, equi it's a shared responsibility for the county. And so <coughs> um, in Boulder County, there's a, as everyone's probably very aware, there's just some quick data points. I'm not gonna belabor on them because we all know we're with housing problems. But um, you know, you can look at, the, from a renter standpoint, 54,000 people are living in households where they're spending over half of their income on housing. Um, so 54% 50 of renters are housing cost burden. And we have 15,000 that are severely cost burden. So we have, like many communities across the country, housing uh, problems and so this regional housing partnership really looks to um, think about how do we change that no, change those numbers and really increase access to affordable housing and of course when you're spending extra money on 
other on housing, you're not able to spend it on essentials, which is healthy food, health care, um, child care, school, all of those things that go that the other 70% of your income needs or should be spent on to have um, be able to, you know, to thrive in, in a community. Can he ask a question? Yes. This refers to all age groups. Yes. Is that correct? Thank you. I mean, it's it's a it's a number that probably comes from HUD of, you know, just generally what, um, you know, when you look at people's income or people's budgets and what should be spent, you know, if you keep that number under 30% in housing costs, you leave money for the other life essentials. So it's across all, I'm sure in seniors, you know, we could probably look at different statistics. Um, the work I'm doing is with all communities. I'm especially interested in talking to seniors in the, in across the region. Um, to hear stories and get information that I can share back with the stakeholders and decision makers. You know, one of the statistics, Danica, around uh, the five times more on health care, especially with older adults, is that percentage tends to be higher for older adults than the rest of the population, and health care also includes medications. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a broader uh, view perhaps on health care and the gr and the percentage is greater for seniors anyways wow. without yeah. the housing uh, cost woven in absolutely um, so like I mentioned the Boulder County Regional Housing Plan has has these goals and so um, a, the big goal is 12% of all homes affordable by 2035 and that is about 18,000 homes across the region to get to 12% we're at 5% now so it's a pretty big goal, and the way that housing affordability is going to be achieved is through lots of different things, not just building, it's housing preservation, so buying um, market rate apartment projects and bringing those into more of an affordable, or keeping them affordable if they're already affordable, preserving mobile home parks, um, funding sources, doing land banking, um, looking for redevelopment opportunities, regulatory processes, and opportunities um, and so one of the big things that is is a part of this is funding sources so as the regional housing plan gets um, implemented they'll be looking at larger funding sources down the road to help pay for the the, the land preservation and the home preservation and um, new development so I'm going to just show a really short video hopefully the sound will come on if not I can this is a video we were at CU in October, talk about housing with a broad um, group of folks from the community. You may recognize some people in here, possibly. With $5,000 in my pocket, I was not able to get a six month sub lease so I can get my son back in my life. I lived on the streets for a long time. It was years before I got stable. What I felt really different about this workshop that I was in was that it centered voices and stories, narratives that we don't typically hear around the affordable housing crisis. Oftentimes, it's centered on just price and people are being squeezed out. There's all these other stories that make certain folks have an even harder time. We need to elevate those stories. I am a single parent. I am a party student. I have two children that they have disabilities. I'm a hair stylist and I'm a hair salon now. And I did that because I know how to teach myself and I know how to survive. Currently, I work as a mental health professional. I use my lived experience with alcohol and mental illness to become certified and help other people in a clinical setting. I was a 25-year hospice worker. I am involved in helping those that do not have voices to be heard. I run an organization here called Boulder Food Rescue. We do healthy food redistribution. I was able to work in a 30-year patrol position as a teacher and administrator. Latino migrant community, 
empower faith-based communities and activate. There's somebody in our group who's going to create a community land trust pilot. Learning, share stories, and personalize issues. Advocate for the right people in the right roles. What kind of society are we if we don't care for each other? By putting myself out there, I'm putting a more positive face on the struggle. By identifying our communities, the economy can be sustained because we are essential. And maybe hopefully, oh no. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Is it starting yeah, over again? Know. Yeah, okay, here we go. So um, hopefully, you've also seen some of the signs. They've been in bus stops and, and buses, I think, especially in Longmont. And um, so I just wanted to share, I'm here today just to share about the Home One Initiative and hear from you really on what types of messages and stories that you'd like to share with, as we kind of broaden the conversation and deepen the conversation around housing and um, just have a kind of explore this issue as a community need and hear um, about how I can help support that and then how, what you can do to help, you know, get change if you're interested in that or what what types of action can be taken so um, one of the things I'm doing is really trying to highlight and um, celebrate successes of affordable housing projects in the community you're probably very well aware of Micah Holmes has everybody heard about it's in your own community I was uh, lucky to go on a tour with Carol and Tim um, a few weeks ago and learn about what they've done and what I'm trying to do is share this success story with everybody across the county so I've shared this with I presented to artist groups and chambers and um, all sorts of housing advisory boards. And so, you know, this is a great example of what a, a partnership can look like when a faith based community donates land and works with um, this permanently supportive housing. Um, and so, I interviewed both Carol and Tim to find out what, you know, what, what the challenges were and what, how, it, how it worked and what lessons learned there might be and what. Um, opportunities there might be for the future and just highlighting this really amazing project that is um, just you know has I think when I was there five out of the six homes were had, were occupied and they were waiting for their last family so really exciting project and again affordable housing innovation can be very small it can be very large I think everyone thinks of affordable housing is very large apartment projects and so I think bringing awareness that it takes place in different ways the last families moving in Saturday and they were doing a call for volunteers. That's great. To help move, to help lift and carry. <laughs> yeah. Lift and carry, yeah. yeah. And I think that's wonderful. Um, what I learned is that it was a really hard project. I mean, um, Carol and the church, you know, it was her first development project and so learning how to do that and how to subdivide land and rezone it and, and you know, taking that process. So there's a lot of support that I think um, the business community could help and architects and other people can help you know, really facilitate these projects so that that lift isn't so um, challenging for someone who's not used to doing this day in, day out. Um, this project I've been working on for since 2014, it's Ponderosa Mobile Home Park in Boulder. It's um, a mobile home park west of Broadway in North Boulder. And it's it was in the county and um, over the years, the infrastructure has become completely um, dilapidated, um, mostly because it's in the county and the city wouldn't you, you couldn't get permits to replace the infrastructure if you weren't in the city and so I had studied this and done some work around the infrastructure um, first for the, the private property owner and what we found was that the costs were so high um, to try and um, replace the infrastructure that the previous owner wasn't willing to do that but so the city then went out and got funding to purchase the mobile home park which was really exciting and so they purchased it a couple years ago and and we just annexed it in November and what's really unique about this project is a commitment to non-displacement. So um, we've worked very hard to design the infrastructure and roads and, and everything so that if people would like to stay in their mobile home, they are welcome to continue to stay in their mobile home. And for some people, that's very important. That's their, they've lived there for 25 years, they've raised their children there, they wanna live in their mobile home. 
Um, and so we're, we're allowing that to happen. And then we're also allowing habitat home replacement on a one-to-one -one basis when, if and when somebody wants a new habitat home. So this project requires a lot of flexibility, um, a lot of political will, a lot of funding, um, a lot of engineering. It's really, but you know, what Boulder is doing around mobile home parks is really, I think, cutting edge where, you know, Lafayette's just working on <coughs> trying to preserve mobile home parks as affordable housing, where Boulder's actually rezoned mobile home parks many years ago to preserve them from development. So a, another kind of success story. Will there the be any tiny homes in that development? No. No, so they'll, if you do a habitat home, you're gonna do a standard habitat sort of one of the designs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yep, and that was, um, that's a really good question. Uh, I think most of the people that live there want home, not tiny homes, because they're used to living in a mobile home. Or they're, they're also large families. There's quite a few very large families. Well, so some mobile homes are the same square footage of some tiny homes. Not, uh, not much different, that's why I asked, yeah. so. Yes, no, that's a, a, that's a good home. question. It's also in the floodplain, 100-year floodplain, so I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I think getting fixed foundation raised elevation homes is also Got a good it. flood protection requirement because it's, where is it located? It's on Violet and um, it's on 10th and Cherry. If you go back, do you know Shiny Mountain Waldorf mm -hmm. School? Yeah, you, don't, you would never know it's there. It's on Formal mm -hmm. Creek. It's a beautiful community. We did everything in Spanish and English. We did, we've done three or four years of community engagement. We worked very closely with the community on a community design process. Um, and so they were very, very involved in this from start to finish. Th will the number of homes be the same as the number of mobile homes? It's yeah. actually gonna be, a, we're at 68 now and it'll go to 73. Okay. So it will slightly increase. Okay. But it's still a pretty low density. What we're trying to do is mirror the same, as you can see in that lower left-hand graphic, because we're allowing people to stay in place, we can't really significantly change the road network, which is, um, but there will be a community center, and there will be a lot more, there's no open space. There's barely any trees there now, and there will be detention ponds and stormwater, and um, it'll be renewable, and, and the new homes, I mean, people are paying, their energy bills are almost as much as their pad cost. You know, if you pay $600 a month in rent, yeah, someone's energy bills are five hundred dollars a month. So the the new home will cost the same as their existing housing cost, which is also um, a huge commitment from from Flatirons Habitat for Humanity and the city. So lots and lots of funding going into this project, though. So I think I wanted to highlight too, kind of the other project didn't have as much subsidy, but it's much smaller, um, and then this one is is a much larger project, but. Um, um, oh, Sorry. is this the end of your presentation? No. I have some remarks, but I want to save yes. them for the end. Um, and so I just wanted to talk to, you know, se housing and seniors and older adults, what are opportunities to um, help support, you know, and what are the housing levers and tools that are, I think, available and specific to kind of um, the aging population? And so aging in place, I hear about a lot and really being able to stay in your home and adapt it to the home or maybe build an ADU in your backyard and live, you know, and rent it and live in that or, or we hear a lot in Boulder about not being able to just even sell a home. There's nowhere to buy something else um, in order to downsize. Multi-generational living, inclusionary housing, so looking at, you know, using inclusionary housing funds that are captured through development, land donation, community land trust, that, mo um, so both examples I highlighted where we took land out of the cost of affordable housing that makes a huge difference so the church donated the land for MICA and Ponderosa is a land trust um, so the residents won't own the land but they'll have a 99 year land lease which really reduce the housing cost especially in Boulder um, density and fill ADUs looking at occupancy restrictions I and mean, we have really strict occupancy in Boulder um, that present prevents like mul even multiple you know friends from living together. You can have more than three unrelated individuals living in a five bedroom house, which is um, interesting. Deed restrictions, preservation, down payment assistance. Um, we just introduced a middle income down payment assistance program in Boulder, fee reductions. So these are all the tools that um, you know we're looking at. So in order, you know, what I'm here to do is to just kind of share the message, hear from you what you're seeing in your, in your community from your friends and colleagues ask you to be involved and write a letter to your council member saying please you know put, keep affordable housing as a priority. Um, 
I brought some postcards and, you know, even do some storytelling. And I'm just really trying to get out and meet with as many folks as possible and, you know, share the message and also build advocacy and um, champions for just continuing to talk about affordable housing as a community priority. Is that the end of your yeah. Can you go back to the seniors slide? Uh -huh. Just yeah. hold that and then um, mm -hmm. so oh, we have sorry. something yeah. to talk about. Oh, yeah. No, Great. that's okay. That's okay. No, I just I just wanted to put the Longmont context out there yeah. on on this. Uh, Longmont is about currently about one point five percent ahead in uh, percentage of affordable units of Boulder County as a whole. However, it's probably gonna the next time we report it, it may drop back because we had to find the affordable rental threshold at 60% AMI, and we think we're going to redefine it back down to 50% because mm -hmm. 65 is to pay it. You're supposed to be able to pay a lot of money, and our people can't. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think we'll we'll probably still be ahead, and we have our inclusionary zoning um, is causing the permit the permitting of a lot of new affordable units. We haven't really seen the impact of that yet because it takes a, a, a year or more to get them out of the ground. But um, we feel like we're really on pace for that. And I also want to put out, I, I think that the, the problem of people being unable to downsize, we've identified that we have another underserved segment, which is where we want to downsize into you know, things that are off, are not subsidized, but available to people at 80 to 100 percent of the area median income or their family size, which is typically one or two for we older adults. Mm -hmm. um, so just wanted that context Thank there. Yeah. What would, um, could you explain that type of unit? Like if you could explain what the um, downsizing, if you in your an ideal world, what that would look like, or um. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it depends on the family. Mm -hmm. So I downsized from a ridiculous, you know, twenty eight hundred square foot home to uh, a fourteen hundred square foot uh -huh. home in in Quail Ridge, and um, that house uh, I paid two hundred thousand dollars cash for it in in uh, maybe 20, 2011, mm -hmm. um, and it's doubled in price and, mm -hmm. and isn't affordable for an awful lot of people anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but that inventory, smaller than that maybe even, um, uh, you know, it has a first floor. It has a first floor um, uh, master. master bedroom and it has a uh, very tiny yard. It's not quite a patio, but but that kind of inventory is, I think, what we'd all like to live right. in, and it, it almost doesn't exist mm -hmm. in Longmont, and it's mostly because of the land prices. Mm -hmm. So our new density stuff will help, but we need people to invest in building that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and those small houses are getting more expensive. Yeah. Yes. The months and years go by. That's right. They go. They go on the market as at at a, at a low price, and then they appreciate really fast. Mm -hmm. So it's a problem. You mentioned um, trying to renovate and adapt existing housing for affordable use, and I'm thinking this is something I remember 20 years ago. I used to drive past these ma mansions that people were building through Boulder County at the time. And thinking, gee, it would be nice if somebody could take one of those houses that's you know, no longer uh, really necessary in the market for large families or whatever, mm -hmm. and subdivide it, make four apartments in there for independent living for seniors. Because uh, there are, I think there are a lot of elders who would not particularly want to live in a large, you know, facility. high rise yes. facility. Mm -hmm. They're able to be mostly independent or get whatever health care they might need in place. And they don't particularly want to live by themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't want to have shared space either. So I mean, uh, 
So that would that be kind of a zoning change, do you think? To I try guess and it would. I don't know. Well, actually, um, our our zoning right now, our, the high, new high density zoning, is amenable to that. So we, you know, we can have if you have enough land space, you can have an auxiliary dwelling unit um, in your backyard. Um, that's what ADU. That's is. what ADU is. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a good thing because that means that you've got somebody else living really close to you mm -hmm. if you're if you're older. Um, I have uh, a uh, a family who would otherwise be hold, uh, homeless living in my upstairs, but that's a transitional arrangement because we have to share the kitchen uh, and we have to share a door, um, and it doesn't really work for seniors because it's upstairs where they live. Um, so, but that sort of thing is also allowed in Boulder, at least for one extra, or allowed in, in Longmont, at least for one extra family. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, you know, you, you can also call it an ADU if it's physically attached to your house. Like uh, structurally, I could put an apartment above my garage, mm -hmm. for example. That's an ADU too, mm -hmm. although again, on my lot, It'd be upstairs. It wouldn't be any good for seniors if I did that. So um, there's our our zoning supports it as infill. Mm -hmm. There's another um, barrier a lot of times to especially seniors um, being able to change their property, sell their property, and downsize, and that has to do with homestead exemption. When they sell, they lose their yeah. homestead at homestead exemption for 10 years. That is so smart, Janine, yeah. because yeah. I'm caught in that. I am I, too. I've got so four I years. am too. <laughs> so, so really, there needs, you know, especially for seniors that are wanting to downsize, mm -hmm. that's gonna, that's a big deal. Great. And, you know, if that could just even be looked at That's or be strange. considered or have some circumstances where, you know, that doesn't have to be a problem. Uh, Can, you know, <coughs> the, the, that is something that the city could lobby for even in, mm -hmm. at the state level. And uh, I, I think that that's a really good point that the original legislators probably didn't think of, but we do want to encourage downsizing. Um, I can't make a motion, but could we quickly make a motion to ask Sandy Cedar to do that? I'll make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> so you. after you vote, or do you want to vote? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you know, maybe in Keep another excited, year. excited, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I make a motion that we have Sandy look into uh, the homestead exemption barrier for seniors downsizing. You're right. I second. All, all in one favor? Is. Any one nays? Is. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So I just want, I think I sent out some information about the homestead exemption to all the board mm -hmm. that uh, there is some movement to take the pool of funds that has not been expended. So we know there's right. unexpended funds and move it to other things other than aging. Um, and move it out of the area agency and aging component. So you have some information there mm -hmm. that you could certainly act on and ask to direct. And if you needed a list of emails, phone numbers of your legislators, I did make lots of copies mm -hmm. today. So cool. I'm happy to send that around. Mm -hmm. so. okay. Well, I have postcards, so. Yeah. <laughs> Use your voice. Yeah. You can write your postcard if you're interested. Okay. Um, We'll pass those yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, can I, go ahead, Art. Can you define affordability, or how that's used in what we're doing? Sure. Now? Well, it, it's changing. So typically, um, it's usually it's under sixty under sixty percent AMI is considered low income housing. Um, in, in Boulder, we've raised it to eighty percent for um, habitat affordable housing. Um, we're also talking about middle income housing, which is typically 80 to 120% AMI. 
those AMI, so for a, in Boulder County, a family of four would be making about $50,000 to be considered affordable. The numbers change by um, where you live, but, and there's lots of charts. And so I was also offering a different definition of affordability is just, you know, when people are paying more than 30% of their income, it, that, it's no longer affordable. So, you know, it, it's, um, it gets complicated, but I think that cost burdened dis people understand that more than area median income and trying to place themselves in this, um, you know, what is a family two or three or four in Longmont versus Lewis, I mean, it's all just lots of, lots of numbers, but it's, um, it's not getting any better. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess my, my next question then, other than Habitat, yeah. uh, are there contractors involved in volunteering, you know, or people in the community <laughs> volunteering for renovation, stuff like that, or do they have to actually be contractors in order to uh, That's a really a good question. Uh, I do, I was on the board for Flatiron Habitat for Humanity, and so obviously they were rely on a lot of volunteer support to build. And same with St. Brain, which is your habitat. Um, I know David Emerson well. I, and I believe Habitat does renovation. Right. Um, so definitely, oh, but you okay. do not have to be a contractor to work on those projects. Um, I think that's a great idea, though, if you had people with contracting skills who want to put them to work helping people renovate and I'm sure there's probably county programs to so do that that was actually one of my questions is the city actually has funds to do some home renovations and I know the last several years there has been funds left over and so how do we market those yeah. programs that uh, that right. are out there to help people make accommodations right. um, and as well as the property tax exemption and property tax work off just different ways to help people stay where they are, which is <coughs> oftentimes more affordable, but need some help making that yeah. happen. So marketing some of those existing programs is probably um, something we could do in Prudence, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I have one, one more quick question is, is it still uh, required contractors who are building uh, what's New the development, green fields? Uh, right, to, to make uh, some of those homes uh, yes. under the affordability. And, and do you know what that number is or how yes. that works? Yes, um, it's, it's also complicated, not as bad as area median of an income, but there are a lot of ways of satisfying that mandate. So the figure is 12%. 12%. If, you know, if you're building a development that is um, larger than 10 units, I believe. Okay. Um, then you are responsible for 12% uh, affordable units, and you can satisfy that by actually building them and putting them on the market or causing them to be you know, built. Um, you can satisfy that by donating land to an organization oh, like okay. Habitat um, or to the city, which will then use it for affordable units. Um, or you can pay a fee in lieu of doing it and that means it, it's a it's a it's a graduated rate. So if you build a, a market house, a non-subsidized house that is accessible to people between 80 and 100 percent of the area median income for the size of the house, you don't have to pay the fee in lieu because we have an underserved band in that area. Mm -hmm. In that, uh, if it's 100 to 110, you pay. A partial percentage of the fee in lieu, and it's a, if it's 120 or above, you pay the full fee in lieu. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty fair deal in that the contractor is uh, are are allowed to use their land in the best way, um, but the city always gets its take its cut, <laughs> um, and it's working pretty well. We're uh, again we're getting a lot of permits for um, both affordable apartments and and affordable market. Units. Um, we haven't seen a huge increase in the inventory yet because um, most of the um, buildings that are coming onto the market now uh, were were permitted before the ordinance was passed, which was just a year ago. So, but it but in terms of permitting, it's working well. We also have some commercial developers and builders that do work directly with. Um, organizations like Habitat, sure. so sure. you know, like the New Mountain Brook development has uh, eight Habitat or eight units, four duplexes, 
on donated land that the infrastructure is being provided by the Mountain Brook developer, and that's also what they donated the land for the Veterans Community Project. Well, thank you. Okay, three quick questions. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the things in your, your clip there, uh, one of the gentlemen speaking said that uh, the money needed to do a down payment on an apartment mm -hmm. could range into the thousands. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's any movement towards assisting with that. The second question is, um, is this, you know, support from HUD? I know there's Section 8 housing, but there's something different than Section 8. There's the Section 8 voucher. Housing choice, or yeah, housing choice vouchers. Right, housing choice vouchers, and I'm wondering if we tap into that. And the other third uh, thing is that do you have Boulder County broken down by city as to the affordable housing problem in each city? I do. And I know I'm out of time, so, so there we go. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. I just I would love to continue the discussion so I can try and answer your questions and um, you could email. Thank you. Um, yeah, please write a card and I will mail them for you or t and I'd love to take pictures of them. I think a big part of what I'm trying to do is storytelling. So even your story right. about opening your home to a homeless family and being able to help them get on their feet, that's the kind of, because that story, if it gets told, maybe other people would consider doing that. So I think I'm also, my ask is um, that if you're interested in telling a story or inviting me to another event, I'd love to come back and, sh and share your story. And I think your questions about um, advocacy and how to make a difference, um, I can follow up with an email on that. Um, your questions, you asked about down payment assistance for apartments, I actually don't know the answer to that, so I can try and find one. Support from HUD and the housing vouchers program. Um, so I don't, I, I don't have like exact answers to your questions, mm -hmm. but I certainly also am working very closely with Karen, Ronnie and Rooney and um, Kathy Fedler at the City of Longmont. So certainly they will have more information about your housing programs. So I certainly know you know them. So Amy and Veronica, our resource specialists, would have some really great stories for you. Great. And in answer to Prudence's question about down payment assistance, um, the Friends of the Longmont Senior Center yes. through the Last Resort Fund do a lot of first month's rent and down payment assistance, uh, down first month's rent and deposit. Yeah. apartments a lot actually because yeah. that that is what was that? clearly a barrier yeah the friends of longmont senior center and amy and veronica are kind of the gateway to those funds great thank you so much for having me um if i'll share a link to the website and if you're interested in joining the home team and being part of this and helping put your skills to work whether it's carpentry or storytelling or baking or yeah. um Whatever it is, we're looking for people to help us. So thank the you. Home team. I hadn't heard that before. Yes. I was aware of your project. Yeah, well we're just launching it. So I'll send you I'll send Michelle a link and thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. And your work. Mm -hmm. yes. And you're not leaving behind a memory stick or anything, are you? Uh no, but okay. I um, just yeah, she's on Google Drive. Should, okay. I should log out on my Google account. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was my point. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a what so do you need? That would be something I, I would regret I later probably. Or if it's a USB stick that you need. Uh, do you have a USB that you can stick I can, in there? I can yeah. put the picture. Yeah, yeah. So that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will share the presentation. With you. Thank you. That'd be great. We'll Thank include you. that in the minutes. Is that right? Perfect. You want to make you a so place holder? Here we go. Awesome. For, for, yeah, I'll send up the link again. Print okay. Okay. You have your USB. I'll stick it in the computer. Oh. <laughs> I'm not that fast. I was going to say. <laughs> so you <laughs> learn when you come. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
try to identify what kind of um, policies interventions will be more feasible to apply and that will actually can work try to tackle climate change. And maybe as you already know, uh, Longman already declared the climate emergency and have facing immediate and you know, very quick ways to actually face how to prevent impacts but also mitigate climate change in the community. So why this is important? Because mostly climate change have been related with many several impacts in the environment, but also in the human flow. So and the communities and the United Nations have um, mentioned and stated that if we don't act, uh, do any kind of actions as soon as possible, many of those implications in changing the climate will affect our communities. So when we start to act now, we can actually reduce the, those impacts in the future. Uh, for those that are not very familiar with climate action, climate change is just changes in temperature, precipitation, the winds, but all these uh, actually are related with some changes in floods, droughts, uh, wildfires, and these are mostly related with uh, emissions of pollution or air pollution that for human activity, multiple human activity have been related with these these emissions. And one of the most known and most common uh, known is the greenhouse gases uh, related to uh, fossil fuels. So 
climate, a credible climate action is actually actions can reduce the impacts of climate change, but also help us to adapt to climate change, make the community more resilient to climate change, uh, but also helping everyone in the community. So not try to think in everyone in the community and have benefit through this mitigation and adaptation to our climate change. So these climate actions have not only the focus to reduce the emissions or make them more resilient in the community, but also try to strengthen the community, make more uh, strengthen the, the economy, reduce the air pollution, improve the human health. So there are many other co benefits of these specific actions. So what is working now, what is in the process uh, now in the city of Long Island is actually identify climate action in different sectors. And this is four main sectors that we are working now, try to identify which kind of actions in each of those sectors can help us to reduce the emissions, but also improve the resilience of the community. And here are some examples of this. This is only transportation, and which kind of actions that we are talking about. So one, one example is to actually improve the network and the service, the quality of the service that already exists, that the, the bus is free. But maybe we need to improve it to other geographical locations, improve the frequency, um, and also expand the schedules. So thinking in how to this actually intervention can reduce not only the emissions, but also improve the quality of life in the community. Other example is improving of how we actually decided to move inside the city. Maybe we choose a better mode of transport that it need, doesn't emit this uh, greenhouse gases, will be beneficial for the environment, but also for the community. And that could be cycling, using public transportation, or walking. So incentivize this mode of transport will be a, a good way to actually tackle mitigation, but also strengthen the, the community. Well, there is infrastructure. There already exists bike lanes in the city, but the bike lanes network maybe is not fully connected. If we actually improve that connectivity, we'll actually attract more cyclists and try to reduce the barriers to use the bicycles inside of the city as a substitution mode for other um, transport modes that actually emit uh, greenhouse gases. Other options are actually improve working schedules. So if you, everyone need to go to work at the same time, there are jams. So the traffic will be worse. If you have flexibility, maybe you don't need to arrive at work at the same time that everyone. So you can reduce the, the, the commute period. But maybe you can also work from home. So you don't need to move to a large place. So you are, can also re help to reduce emissions. And finally, the most common one is like electric vehicles. Like uh, in, main, in transportation, ele uh, electrification is one of the big solutions that have been proposed is not in terms of emission is good, but maybe then provide an other co-benefits, like if we jump to walking or cycling or public transportation, reduce also traffic accidents, noise, uh, and actually we can actually uh, see and gather more with our communities. So these are some examples of this um, climate actions that could help to reduce emissions that it calls mitigations and adapt to, and make it more resilient the community that it calls adaptation. So what we need from you is actually input to, uh, to identify how we can make more, make better these uh, specific actions. Which kind of those actions maybe from your vision could be harmful or have unintended consequences that maybe uh, put a lot of uh, station to charge electric vehicles doesn't help to you because you don't have electric vehicle because you don't uh, have access to this kind of very expensive uh, vehicles. So try to take the, the different point of views to try to improve these uh, specific climate actions. And finally, what we could missing in this process? Uh, because we are part of the community, this climate action is coming from a group of citizens and persons who work also inside the city and experts, but we actually don't gather all the visions possible from the city. And it is important from us to hear from different parts of the community to actually understand better how this common action can be implemented in a better way that actually benefit for everyone, any kind of part of the community. So I have this printed for you. So uh, maybe I, what I wanted to start to do is uh, a quick discussion of, in terms of those, 
this chart that yeah. we have here. Okay. And those ones that we have from transportation, um, try to think in which, which kind of uh, things could be missing here that you think could be important. We can These kind of things maybe will be not totally beneficial for you or could be harmful for you or something that you think that makes a lot of sense or what could be missing for, for this perspective. Uh, yeah. Before she, uh, any of the board starts speaking, David, do you, David, do you need a recorder? Do you need me I to make take, notes? I will take notes. You will take yeah, yeah. Okay. But right. either way, I don't want it. Actually, I wanted to start to the discussion, but if it would be possible, I wanted to actually, actually collect your email addresses because we haven't surveyed. Is so that what the clipboard is? Yeah, exactly. So I do you agree with that, uh, because I know that we don't have a lot of time. That will be a more efficient way to start. I will want to finish the, the session, but I want to start the discussion so you feel familiar with what we are discussing and what the, the survey is all, it's about. So thinking in terms of this climate action in terms of trans transportation and these questions. Yeah. So I know people and I'm familiar with the lack of transportation <coughs> and why people <coughs> use their vehicles yeah. and not the bus. Yeah. I think the bus routes should be reviewed and overhauled so that they go places that people want to go, like to the grocery store, to the dentist to the doctor. I read that Boulder overhauled their bus routes and they use it. So how about Longmont? It's time. Yeah, so for that, w what do you suggest we need? Do we need to understand better, better how the people, where their destination, where they actually, the people, origins and destinations? Yeah, I mean, Longmont keeps growing. For instance, I live in southwest Longmont and there is no bus that goes down airport road into right. town uh, in to my dentist, to my doctor, it doesn't happen. Perfect. So, yeah. I, I have to agree with that, because um, if I want to go, and I was on the planning academy, as he knows, is that you cannot, I cannot bike ride from my home on the west side, from Long's Peak Avenue, to Whole Foods and Village of the Peaks, um, you certainly would never ride on Hover nope. um, unless you wanted to be killed. Um, so there's no, as, as you said, this, Susan, is there's no connection between what you need to do and what is a safe bike route. I also want to put in a plug for electric charging stations. Not every electric car is a Tesla. Yeah. Um, uh, my sister-in-law just bought a VW Electric. They are cheap. They only go 150 miles. Yeah. Um, so electric charging stations everywhere would be helpful. And also um, support for, um, I'm not a fan of solar paneling, but some people are, support financial incentives for solar paneling. And I know the ranch, many ranches have them, but I think for the homes on new construction should be required to have solar. Good, excellent. So I want to come back to for more specificity. So when you mentioned bike rides and safety, mm -hmm. because one of the, the actions is actually improve connectivity right. based on what already exists, but you feel that this type of bike lanes is something that encourage yeah. you to use it from your yeah, perspective? Yeah, because I, I usually, yeah, definitely, yeah. Same, same as the bus. It has to go someplace and it has to be The west side of town is like mm -hmm. you don't exist Yeah. as far as connectivity. Right, I have to agree. I think one of the issues in and around transportation involves having to work with RTD. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah, don't have a city the bus. Drive. Yeah. And so RTD is facing challenges financially and with hiring employees. And so that's an obstacle in itself. I wish I had a very good 
solution to that problem, but I don't. And they kind of dictate where the buses will go, not necessarily where they need to go, but you know where they are going to go. So this is a great point, uh, because one of the questions that you will see in the survey, if you're willing to, to answer uh, that survey, is like I also thinking in, in possibilities on what, as you mentioned, maybe the city don't have all the resources to actually implement everything, so 100% or maintain it for several, several years. So where will be the innovative solutions to actually the city can support this kind of a actions for climate change. If there are other priorities also in the city that need to be covered, where do you have any suggestions or ideas on what will be an innovative way to attract resources or support these activities in the long term? Mm -hmm. Maybe in the short term it will be easy or more feasible to do it, but in the long term maybe these are very expensive uh, interventions to actually maintain. Um, so thinking in innovative solutions and different ways to actually support uh, the maintenance of these uh, interventions will be very helpful for us to hear from you, your perspective. If we try to think in like that, we don't have at all, all the solutions. So the city uh, provides uh, financial support for free bus services here <laughs> by reason to drive RTD. So I'm wondering if those resources can be deployed away from RTD within the city for the, to run transportation such as jitney buses, smaller buses, those buses are always empty. Yeah. Um, electric. Electric, you know, rather than giving our money to someone who it, it doesn't meet the needs of the city, yep. and, and we're providing them financial support to do something that they don't do very well. Yeah, so uh, improve efficiency. Like as uh, you mentioned, like uh, we have five big buses, and mostly they're empty. Maybe it would be better to have ten small ones, so the frequency will be higher, the coupons will be higher, and mm -hmm. if they can be electric, mm -hmm. that exactly. will be fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, so this kind of visions uh, are very helpful for us, for us to actually hear from you and try to understand better you, your uh, options or how you your thoughts. So in terms of public transportation, what are the main barriers to actually don't prefer or don't use all the time public transportation? How does public transportation, besides maybe frequency or destinations, come, could be more attractive for you to be as a main option for moving inside the city. Um, because those sounds very logical and very nice, but at the end, um, even the, the, the public transportation is free, as you mentioned, they're empty buses. So why we are not achieving to attract people? How we can improve that part? Um, if you look at countries, you can't really even look at cities in the United States and get a good example. But if you look at countries like Japan that have successful uh, public transportation ridership, the uh, intelligent choice of destination and frequency are the two determining factors as to whether mm -hmm. people ride. But frequency, we're not even in the right ballpark. We're talking 10 minutes instead of an hour in terms of frequency because if it's an hour, it takes, your transit time is three times as long as it would be at least to go by car. Yeah. I think the other thing is is that you have to, for people who are not used to public transportation, yeah. okay, culturally, they may have been born here or in California, so they may not be used to public transportation, is that there has to be some kind of, a, a, for want of a better word, marketing push. Yeah. To s by the city to say, we've improved, we're riding this, take the bus, you can now safely bike to Whole Foods without getting killed. So <laughs> I think that, you know, there's also a part for the city to promote it make so it that people make it attractive. You know, it's going to run more frequently. Um, you know, because it's a mystery if 
if you wait for the bus when it's coming. It's a mysterious thing. One of the things that some areas have done successfully within the United States is look at all of the different little transportation providers and combining those resources. So really looking at transportation what the way Longmont is now looking at affordable housing, but looking mm -hmm. at it as a reg regional sort of perspective. So um, for older adults who are Medicaid eligible, they have to call here and they get their money through the state and it goes to this agency. Or if they're not Medicaid, they can call here and they can get, and so there's different providers getting different money for different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking at how to think about resources differently. What are we paying collectively with all mm -hmm. this administrative oversight, with mm -hmm. the um, challenges people are having in scheduling rides? And so I think that if we looked at really where our transportation dollars were going as statewide and certainly regionally north of Denver, we might be able to use those resources differently mm -hmm. and more efficiently and more effectively, truly. Um, there, so I think what we think about RTD and we think about regional, we think Longmont to Denver, you know, or that I, we have trouble even getting older adults from East Longmont, which happens to be Weld County, to a healthcare person in Boulder mm -hmm. County. Yep. So we have to think differently about how we fund all those little different transportation options. Um, and we have to, I think there could be some additional released resources if we would think about how we do that more effectively. Mm -hmm. And I know Georgia did that. They took a whole series of counties along the east coast of Georgia. And they made them all apply to one funder and they took all the money and they had to prove some yeah. efficiency and some effectiveness. So there could be a release yeah. of some dollars yeah. if we looked at it differently than just Boulder County. Yeah, no, excellent point. Michelle, do you have any data about VIA's new uh, on-demand service? Is it working? Is it implemented? So I'm not sure it's implemented yet. They're just doing some education. So we're actually doing a whole series of mobility for all training through Boulder County. And we start those sessions um, this month. Mm -hmm. And it's really helping older adults use ride arranging applications and services. And VIA is hired their own person to mm -hmm. do their own app uh, development. So I'll be curious to see yeah. how that works. Because they're late. They're late. <laughs> they are. Yeah. Well, no, June is supposed to be the first of the year. Yeah, so they're moving on it. I don't believe it's fully implemented yet. I think that the other piece that certainly is missing for me Good. in this list, yeah. and I said this at a city staff meeting around this issue recently, is when you look at a 244% increase in people 85 plus in the next 30 years, um, purchasing an electric vehicle is probably not in their plan. The bus doesn't provide some of those additional supportive services, uh, RTD does not. So where does that demographic fit in some of these lists? I don't see, I don't see it. So, so I think that's a self-driving. <laughs> self <-driving. laughs> but that's going to be a new cost too. Yeah. Right. But we, uh, we are not sure when that actually will happen. But yeah. we are in that process. Mm -hmm. But some based on that, what is missing? Like at, I, for I that, think that mission, group is missing. So yeah. Yeah. That's a good for point. that group, what will be the option? What do you see as an option? Right. What do you see like a, you want it to to happen here? So. Um, Two years ago, when we when we did the thing that got to same day service from Via, right. that was actually a motion for the city to consider a subsidized ride hailing service, and they didn't do it. And I'm glad you concur with me that that motion was stated that way. Um, and I think that needs to be reconsidered because. That would work, and the ride say hailing services do have trip optimization um, software, which I believe VIA does not, and uh, so we could be reducing traffic and emissions and also up mm -hmm. the service for seniors. Mm -hmm. So Douglas County did do a concierge service for mm -hmm. ride arranging and mm -hmm. did subsidize it. I don't know the status of that um, pilot now, 
-hmm. but I think that's an interesting one to, to look at. So yeah. if you didn't have a smartphone or you weren't sure about loading your credit card on your phone and using right arranging, Douglas County offered a concierge service to help people mm -hmm. figure that out. That would be mm -hmm. great. Yeah. yeah, because there's, okay, there's things that happen. Like I know a lady and her son goes to dialysis. He's still in his 50s, capable of driving. His car wouldn't start. He can't miss his dialysis appointment. She called me in a panic. I said, and the reason, they tried calling Z-Trip first. Oh, we don't know when we can get there. You're a cab service. You don't know when you can get there? <laughs> Ridiculous. That's very true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, think upping yeah, so. those services would be, yeah. even this is focusing on older adults, I think in terms of provide education, you would need to include education of the youth that, that looking at alternatives to driving a car has to start very early on mm -hmm. yeah. in middle school, in high school and engage young people to become a part of the solution. Excellent point. But yep. uh, this is what aging needs, really. Right. Because aging starts since the beginning. So <laughs> that is the process. If you want to be a healthy adult, you need to be a healthy children. And you, these behaviors, you will keep it, uh, you learn early. Right. But it's an excellent point. Thank you. Because it's not just knowing how to ride a bicycle. It's knowing how to ride a bicycle in town. And in and <laughs> Or be a pedestrian in town, it's, which sounds simple, but if you don't train young people to stop at stoplights, look both ways when they cross the road, um, they will feel unsafe, and the rest of the road users will feel unsafe. Yeah, yeah. So I just had a uh, friend tell me last night who is uh, blind, and um, she's a Kaiser member. And she bought the transportation benefit, which is really cheap. I think it's fifteen dollars a year. And they use something called Blue Nile transportation. And she said it was the easiest thing. Meanwhile, she has somewhere to go on Friday, and she tried Via on Monday, and they said they couldn't transport her at twelve thirty on Friday. It's that's, like that's standard answer. Really? That I hear. So I'm picking her up, but it's not for a Kaiser appointment because they have their own transportation system. Blue Nile Transport dot com. <laughs> I don't know that one, so I'm not yeah. going to know that. Mm -hmm. Blue Nile. Yeah. L N I L E like the river. Okay. Yeah, that's that's uh, uh, good information that Via is out of compliance. Mm. Yeah, I, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> so, this is just an example, and we have another examples of. Uh, sectors but also actions that could be worse I don't know than mm. running out of time but the idea is like that you start to see this an, as an options uh, and we wanted to hear and learn from you your visions your priorities so uh, thank you for sharing with you uh, with me um, your email addresses I will send the link to you for this specific survey with you when you will have a chance or more opportunity to actually write your thoughts for different sectors and specific actions. And I hope uh, this inspires you to thinking about climate change, how we can actually reduce our emissions now, and how we can improve our, our community in terms of uh, resilience to, to these impacts that the climate change is bringing to us. And all this information will be on that email. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice. I just did a home energy assessment at my home because the city sent out an email because I was looking to do one. It was like between three and four hundred dollars. I'm not doing that. But the city sent an email for sixty. So I was there for four hours. I did that too. Yeah. And have it had the report. It's very very useful. Very useful. Get some good information. Huh? Yeah, it was very good information. It was four hours, but I work at home, so I go well, four hours. hours. Do you? For sixty yeah. dollars? That's yeah. Really yeah, that is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. David, what is the yeah. company you work for? 
So I'm, that was I'm really sorry, good I didn't explain that part, but I'm part of the Colorado State University. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. So I'm a professor in Colorado State. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we're going to need to move on. Uh, time wise, uh, the annual report, report first draft. Um, Michelle, do you want to? Well, we sent it, it in out. Yes. Yes. So, uh, um, Janine and I went through all the minutes and all the goals <laughs> and took notes. So, um, I don't know uh, if you want to give folks a month to come back with comments or if they have comments today. I'm happy to take notes, Janine, and we can refresh it. Uh, did everyone have an opportunity to read the annual report? And any comments, any questions, anything that we did that you see that we did not include uh, in the annual report? I just had two quickies. Um, in the, the board member liaisons, um, some have one and some have two board members. Are they, is two the default or one? We established alternates, so do you think I should note the alternate Yeah, role? Some, have, some of them have okay. two names and some just have one. Yeah, so in some cases the board, uh, somebody wanted to be an alternate or we needed an alternate. So, so if I chose to do that, I would let you know. Yeah, yeah, but in the yes. annual report, do you think that should be noted, I member so. versus alternate? I think so. Okay. For instance, um, with AAA, uh, the alternate is not a voting member. Right. And can, you know, can attend the meetings, but not vote. Yeah. All those differences are there because everybody did their bylaws independently. So we can't regularize it, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, David. And then the one other question I had was the, the list of outreach resource fairs at Central for 2019. Is, is that list updated annually? Is there one for 2020? If you look at the bottom of your agenda, it's probably in there. Yeah, Janine and I uh, started to update some of that, I thought. Yeah, there we have yes, two. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, for right now. All right. And that's regularly updated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I think, Janine, if folks want another month, that's fine. If you're regular, ready to make a motion and approve, then we can send this uh, on to council. Um, it's up to you all. How you want to proceed? I make a motion that we could approve this. Do I hear a second for that mm -hmm. motion? Who was that? She'll second. Do we need to vote, or, or is my protocol to just uh, 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 take silence? I don't. I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, okay. but we can do it. All in favor of accepting the annual uh, report. I Sending it on to the city council. Okay. All right. Um, again, under old business, Michelle, foot care uh, update. So I think uh, some of you have talked to some of our providers. I've gotten three different uh, companies that are interested in applying for the RFP when it gets released. So. I'm working with Valerie Scott in purchasing to put that together, and uh, hopefully that will be out by the end of the month. And um, in the meantime, we're referring people to uh, folks who are a certified foot care specialist, and we'll continue to move that forward. So we'll have the scope of services, and then um, you all will have an opportunity to be involved in the selection process. So it is moving forward, and thank you. I'm keeping a list of the potential vendors, so right. And the extended trip report. Yeah. So I did follow up with Teresa about the plantation uh, tour that is scheduled for December. 
Um, so we first advertised this in the December, January, uh, February, so it came out, I guess, in November. Um, it is a tour package that comes from the American Steamboat Company. That's the steamship we're using uh, that goes up the Mississippi. And so that is their name. That is under what they promote it. I did talk to T because she has done this tour before. Uh, Teresa Schulte T, we uh, call her. She says it's a very balanced tour in terms of education. It's not uh, in any way, shape, or form a celebration of the plantation life or the slavery or the that existed. It does a lot of, as we suspected last uh, month, I think we talked about the focus on some of the architectural element, but certainly the education um, and the, the reality of history is very well uh, represented. So um, she felt like uh, it hasn't been an issue. Uh, they use the term plantation. Uh, they could have said farm, ranch, you know, any of those kinds of terms. It's got sort of this, this element of architect. So um, that was uh, the follow-up uh, that I received from Teresa. Thank you. Right. Does anyone have any discussion around, uh, about that? Moving on to protocol updates. Yeah, I realize this was a lot of reading, and I do want to apologize for that. These um, protocols that you received are ones we have had in place with our information and referral staff for several years, uh, the case management, the information and referral, and home visits. And so we are in the process of taking these to the county level and really looking at them for all of the resource specialists in the various municipalities and in Boulder County. And so it was an opportunity just to refresh. Um, there have been some, uh, in another community, I, I received a call from the senior services manager saying, well, do you allow your staff to do home visits? And um, there are actually some assessments that we have to go into the home. And our philosophy has always been you can often learn more in a home visit mm -hmm. uh, than you can in an office visit. So we feel very strongly about continuing that, and, um, but we want to do it safely. And many, many other agencies have stopped doing home visits, mm -hmm. um, and that has not been our philosophy. So um, I think it's important if, of the three of them for you all to review that one kind of from that perspective. The case management protocol, um, I would say we've done case management for years and years, um, and people don't uh, like that term. Like, I am not a case to be managed. Don't, you know, what you, the service you provide me should not be a case management. And so we really have tried to make sure that we are using the right words, the right approaches to our case management. And for Longmont Senior Services, we have focused on providing case management services for low income, unsupported, and unsupported older adults. So if you have the resources uh, to pay for case management, we will refer you to one of the private case management agencies to do that. Um, but that has been kind of our approach to case management. It's often short term. We often talk about just sort of holding someone safely in the community until something um, more long-term comes into play. That's sort of been our case management. I would tell you there are other municipalities who feel like this is not a business uh, government should be in. We see it as a significant need, for especially for uh, low-income and unsupported older adults who have no one else. So that's kind of the overview of that one. And then for our supportive services, the at-risk adults, this is changing. And there's actually a couple laws in the legislature right now around mandatory reporting mm -hmm. and at-risk adults. Two changes, uh, one, uh, two pretty significant changes are being considered. One, and I think I sent you some information about this. One is that you will now be able to, if you are a mandatory reporter, as our staff are, you can re mandatory report to police or adult protection. 
when the law passed in 2016, it was only to police. And so they're looking at changing it so you can report to either police or adult protection. The second change they're, they're considering is um, the approach has been from our adult protective services when they go out on a self-neglect call, they'll say, Susan, what's your name? When were you born? Who's president? Where do you live? Who's your blah, blah, blah. If Susan can answer all those questions and appears fairly cogent, they're going to say, we've been asked to you know, check you out. Do you still want us to be involved? And Susan says, no, I don't want you involved. I can take care of myself. They will leave. The law is looking at changing so that they will still have to do an investigation, whether you appear uh, cognitively able or not. So that's kind of a change. It will result in more investigation time and uh, more work. So those are those are a couple things happening in the elder um, and at-risk adult world. This is kind of our protocol of how we treat self-neglect as a staff versus a mandatory report when there is uh, a suspicion of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. So. I don't know that you want to discuss. If you came prepared to discuss, I'd love to hear your comments, or we can certainly, um, you can write them down and leave them with me, however you so choose, because this was a lot of reading and a lot of preparation today. Can I just make one comment? I, when I looked at these, um, I was really pleased to see the emphasis on staff safety. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I, I'm assuming that that would apply to volunteer yes. who should they have an occasion to do a home visit. Um, and I know from my experience, and I, I had one really dicey experience as a volunteer for peer counseling um, going to a private home. I don't wish I had been bright enough to think of some of these protective things at that time. So I, I hope the volunteers will be made aware of and I yeah. think that we need to do a better job of weaving that volunteer component into these protocols. So thank you for yeah. mentioning that. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was pretty impressed with that. Mm. Yeah. I did have a question about how you see a bed bug, but <laughs> <laughs> you asked. <laughs> so we often know ahead of time because oh, okay. people will say, "I need help." We have bed bugs. I need help okay. re remediating them. Yeah. All right, definitely. <laughs> um, customer service issues, Marcia? Yes. Um, I had a, a constituent uh, who is a, a snowbird, so she they live part of the time somewhere else and part of the time here. During the time that they're here. Uh, um, or that they're away, they have a, a friend uh, in the ha home so that it's not unoccupied. And um, the snowbird woman has a mother with dementia who lives with her and a recently deceased father. And the situation is that the electric bills are in the deceased father's name, the city utility bills in the deceased father's name, and we don't have any procedure for changing the name on an account or canceling an account and, um, and uh, starting up a new one. If you are remote, you're supposed to walk the death certificate in and go through this big Megillah that just cannot be done remotely. And so what we have is a woman approximately my age and and her mother with some form of dementia um, and the mother gets triggered every month when the when the bill comes and I've been working with her for weeks and we have not satisfactorily um, resolved that. They've now told her that she can use the computer interface. Well, the computer interface exists, but she can't use it. And uh, so I still don't have resolution for this woman. Um, and uh, 
Uh, I am sure that her case is not alone. I'm sure because my mother lived with me with dementia and I went through all of that in terms of uh, establishing a conservatorship and um, getting all the accounts switched around. And I would like to have this board recommend that the city utility building take a look at improving the usability of those remote control services uh, for older adults because they're not usable now and we need a review. I will make a motion in council no matter what, but I would it would be a lot stronger if you guys would vote to support at the idea. So if you like, and I'm happy with your discussion on it. Are you is, are you limiting it to things like utility accounts or other types of that was the services. that was the triggering event but if others have suggestions for customer service that is failing for older adults um, let's make a list you know I had a situation with um, direct TV which is in the mm -hmm. spouse's name who deceased and the, the widow couldn't couldn't get any any sense out of direct TV they yes. said, well, you're not on the account, so we can't talk to you. So we can't regulate right. direct TV, unfortunately. No. Um, although that might be another lobbying suggestion, mm -hmm. is that the state could have regulations for operating a business here. Um, and, and that might even be a, a, a separate resolution. But um, right now, I think we're talking about city services. Sure. I would absolutely invite all of you to uh, to email me if there's a situation that comes up that is a particular issue for an older adult within a city service. Um, I, I am absolutely committed to following up with my colleagues. I have pretty good relationships with most of them around specific issues. And one of the things that we've been working on through the Senior Computer Tech Program is a, a workshop, a one-time thing on here's all the city sort of technology interfaces mm -hmm. and what they can do for you, what they, how to work them, where, and, and actually use the class as sort of a review of what's not working, what's not very friendly, and what, what is really great. So it's good to have specifics like the one Marsha is raising, um, certainly on top of dealing with uh, recent death or dementia, y you add on this, it, it just compile, compounds everything. So I would love to know those specifics so that I can follow up on them uh, immediately um, yeah. as I can. And it helps us design this program we've been talking to uh, the assistant city manager about doing, about the various changes in technology that some people are not necessarily keep able they to keep with. But yeah. it's inside as well as outside. Right. This, this, yeah. The city just failed to consider all the use cases around people who are experienced, not, ju not just that they're not good with a computer, but that they're situations that aren't every day. You know, the city knows how to handle it if you move, if you're going to cancel your account, if you're starting a new account, and then they think they're done. But but all of these ones about conservatorships and deaths and family consolidations, yeah. they don't handle that very well And at it's all. not just Longmont. No, it's, it's all over, but it's Longmont all we over. can control. Right. Um, uh, another, another good one to add to the list, and uh, what I'm going to suggest is, is maybe we should think about it for a month or two months and then put it back on the agenda, um, but let's not forget it. Um, because you're right, collecting incident reports would be great. I do have one other one, which is the special services for people that have medical devices at home, uh, which is, is both getting a discount on their electric rates and being the, uh, on the list for first restoration of service after an outage, uh, and having somebody come check on you to see if you lost consciousness while your respirator wasn't working and stuff like that. The city has a service. It's really hard to find. Not many people know about it, and it's not easy to sign up for. And is that on the city's website? Somewhere, yeah. Yeah, the city's <laughs> website, I have to tell you, is leads a lot to be desired myself. Yes. Yep. And I'm pretty computer literate. Me too. Right, so it's like, <laughs> whoa. 
So we do need a motion for... Um, do we need a motion, or is it, does anybody have an objection to no, collecting the reports and then yeah. coming go back in it. two months yeah. or something? I think that's, that's just great. Great. If Michelle sets the agenda, then we don't need a motion. I think between that. Janine and I's notes, we'll, we'll make sure it gets back. Okay. Okay, yeah. Because, yeah. uh, you know, to put it in a generic form, you know, to present, mm -hmm. we need to include all it's you know a whole a gamut of things mm -hmm. and uh and to make it in the form of a recommendation okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so we're tabling that till when we're going to set a date or two, two months is what i heard marcia mm -hmm. say yes. Yes. a month or two but not yeah. long Right. Yeah, not not long. Right. I thought one month is probably too short because you you know you have friends and you don't talk to them every single right. month. Right. And, um, but and if you can give that information to Michelle or I so <coughs> that we can put it in a format that would include everybody's experience and concern regarding these services and how the city uh, attends to them. Okay, thank you all. It's, thank it's, you. I think it's clear that we hit a note with this one. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Nodding heads. Um, so I would like to um, move on in terms of new business. Anybody? Any new business? That the one, the agenda items that on are on here. I understand Prudence and Sheila got this recommendation from the city clerk about establishing a unique email account that that you use exclusively for board communications. Is that ringing a bell, Prudence or Sheila? No. Okay. So I received uh, an email from the city clerk as the staff liaison to this board that it is a recommendation coming from the city clerk's office, it is not a requirement, uh, about creating a unique email that is specifically for your board communications. At this point, I think the board communications come from me. They're the, right. uh, and, and um, I'm not aware of, we've never voted by email, we've never, no. but, so let me just say this, this is a recommendation, not a requirement. Um, if you decide to pursue this recommendation, you probably need to let me know so I make sure to change your email. Um, I happen to be one of those people that still has an AOL email address and I guess that's really passe, I, I don't know. <laughs> and I just don't wanna go through the trouble of changing my email, but I, I would, I, I get it that you have to take steps to do that. I'm not the most savvy kind of person when it comes to that. Have you experienced any need for that sort of human, unique communication? Well, my city email is public, just like Marsha's right. is, so it's already and uh, completely open. Mm -hmm. Anybody could pursue it at any time. Yes. And we're required to use those. Right. Or and we're I supposed know. to. Right. <laughs> yes. Right. yes. Um, and so I think this is probably more pertinent, maybe Marcia knows, to other boards and commissions than the Senior Citizen Advisory Board Commission uh, Board. But anyways, I said, uh, and I was asked to bring this to you all. Um, Susan's saying no. Yeah, no, I have enough in my no, answer. No, I have no, no need no. to but change Unless we know we need it. Okay, and then, not hearing then they can get another new board member. <coughs> the other, oh. the other couple things um, she has uh, offered uh, the ABCs of parliamentary procedure. It's a pretty simple book, so I asked her to send one. Um, I thought I'd share that with Janine. Um, they are looking at scheduling a training for board chairpersons. Um, so if you feel like that would be helpful, Janine, you and I can talk, and I can pass your name on to that. And then there is a tip sheet they've created called um, what to do if a reporter calls. I, I can tell you in 30 some years, I don't believe a reporter has ever reached out to an advisory <laughs> board member, but it could happen. Um, and if that's something you're interested in having a copy of, I'm happy to make copies and forward that. I see a no. I'd like to see it. You'd like to see it? Okay. Anybody else want to see it, what to do? I actually would. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
So I will get a couple of those. All right. Thank you. Things are always changing. Uh, and yes, on the book, given that I am not educated <laughs> in terms of parliamentary procedure. Parliamentary procedure. <laughs> I, I did already ask that it should probably be okay. in is that you go send that to everybody on the parliamentary? Would procedures? you like it? Yes, yes. 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 Oh, that, that's another yeah. yeah. thing. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Got okay. It. it's not 500 pages. Mm -hmm. So we could support you. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I am always open to support in those areas. Well, I'm on three different boards, and they're all different. Yeah. yeah. We're doing so much <laughs> good so to educate Years everybody. and years ago, I had a one pager cheat sheet on Robert's Rules, and they yeah. don't call it Robert's Rules anymore. Oh, no, right. no. So, I'm not sure my cheat sheet's still accurate. Yeah. Um, moving on to reports, um, Michelle. So um, I think I forwarded a request from Brandy about support for the caregiver symposium on April eighth at the Jewish Community Center in Boulder. It's sort of staffing our senior Longmont Senior Services table at the JCC during the symposium. Jack uh, indicated he could do the afternoon shift from 12.30 to 3. Is there anybody interested in doing the 8 to 10.30 shift? Brandy will set up the table and take it down. So it's really about standing there, handing out material about Longmont Senior Services and our programs and services for caregivers, um, answering questions, that kind of thing. So April, Lane. <laughs> Sheila, are you interested? I'll check my calendar and okay. let you know. Yeah, that's okay. And, and you as well? Back up. Yeah. Okay. April the It's 8th. April 8th. Thank um, you. Do you know where the JCC yeah. is in Boulder? Okay. Okay, great. Um, I handed out the legislative list. Um, so, uh, as across the nation, you know, coronavirus seems of to be taking hold. Uh, yesterday it seemed like only the Democratic uh, Super Tuesday Republican superseded coronavirus on the news, but um, our city manager is having a meeting this afternoon. We've been getting lots of inquiries here. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, obviously the deaths in Washington State were mostly <laughs> older people. so. Um, Here's where I'm at. I am really just, as the manager of this facility, promoting what we're hearing nationally and from the CDC. Wash your hands, cover your cough, stay home if you're sick, and keep your hands away from your face. Um, so Monica has posters uh, similar to that one, which is in Spanish back there. We're doing English and Spanish. Oh, it's in both over there. Yeah. We're putting those up and around the building on the bathroom doors. We um, are attempting to purchase, believe it or not, uh, pump hand sanitizer um, and chlor uh, kind of Clorox disinfectant wipes to put on our two vans so when we go on excursions so you can come back because you don't always have access to a sink, right? You've been in a public place in a theater or something and you're coming back. So we're looking at having those on our vehicles. Um, and that's really it at this point. Um, we haven't had anything that says, you know, gatherings over 100 people or anything like that. So if you all are hearing things or have ideas, something I should be doing differently, um, we're also, uh, the meals program is getting some additional inquiries, like what are you doing, what are you doing kind of thing. So curious if you feel like I should be doing something different, taking this more seriously at this point. Um, thoughts that I'm, I need to pursue? I would think that uh, trying to get ahead of what the, the public health experts are going to recommend is going to be kind of productive. Uh, for instance, masks, for a while there we all thought we all should all go out and get a box of masks and wear them all the time, and now you know, that, yeah. that just makes it harder for them to have them available for professionals that need them. So don't get ahead of the public yeah. health experts. Yeah. That's what I hear you saying. There are some other common sense things, like put likes by shared keyboards, which are a big transmitter things that aren't 
hard and fast public health re rec recommendations, but they are uh, conveniences for people to be mindful of. Um, uh, another one that um, I'm investigating myself uh, is uh, blow dryers in, in public places may be dangerous because they put uh, bac both bacteria right. and viruses in the air. So if you have a choice, use a compostable paper towel. Um, Can I make a suggestion that doesn't have to do with COVID-19? Um, one of the things that I, I thought was very good, uh, a place I worked, was that when you're in the bathroom, after you wash your hands, you then go towards the door and you <laughs> hold the door. And uh, what they did in their corporate offices, as well as uh, the medical facilities, is right next to the door was a little square thing that was compostable that you pulled out and you opened the door with that. A wipe just for a the wipe. door handle. Okay. Yeah, Not, but so that I thought was good. And I also think um, in, the, in the bathroom, and I don't know whether it's here because I try not to go to the bathroom here, but um, <laughs> for a variety of reasons, um, is uh, how to wash your hands. Uh, believe it or not, this it, it, people don't really know how to wash their hands. Um, you have to sing happy birthday twice. Right, <laughs> or, or uh, you know, Sweet. row, row, row your boat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Demi Museum in the kids' bathroom has row, row, row your boat. Uh, yeah, I thought that was kind of a cute thing. Um, so, so just because I think hand washing is very important, and I just don't think people know how to do it. And yeah. also, there are instructions on the CDC website too. Yeah, so yeah. there are. We, we could use those. those. And uh, another thing that we don't think about is when you wash your hands and go to all that trouble, if you use your hands to turn off the water, <laughs> right? That's the <laughs> you got. You need to use a paper right. towel to right. turn off the water. Yeah, yeah. If so it's not. Right, sensor based, mm -hmm. which most of the more right. public places are now. Um, uh, about your little wipes to wipe down the door mm -hmm. handle. The other thing is to put the compost bin right by the door right. Right. instead right. of under the sink. Right. You just carry right. your towel over there, open the door with it, and then right. throw it away. Yep. So I, we do not have a compost bin in the restroom, so I'm making that note. Um, and we did recently purchase a piece of equipment, it's a handheld piece of equipment called Protexus, and it's, we actually purchased it so that we could clean the fitness equipment, the hand sure. weights and yeah. um, bands and all that, um, but it actually can be used on tabletops and chair uh, rails and other places people are putting. Uh, so we purchased that before the coronavirus, <laughs> it just came. Um, and so Martin has really kind of elevated his, uh, his work around that. So that's been good. So just two other quick things. We hired Griffin Gastel. He's our new custodian. He's working evenings. It's been a um, week and a half and it's been fabulous. I just am thrilled. He's off to a really great start. We will do interviews for the resource specialist. Art and Sarah both offered to help with that. We had um, 25 uh, applications, not a lot. Uh, 17 were um, bilingual. Two of the 17 were not fully bilingual. Eight were not bilingual at all. So we're not even really entertaining those eight. Um, we are going to have Monica call all of the candidates to schedule their interview and that's gonna be 100% in Spanish. So. Um, we've never done that before, oh, but we're going to give that a go. And so we're looking at March 19th and 20th for those interviews. So right as here, soon yeah. as I know exactly how many we'll interview, we may just interview on Friday um, okay. rather than both days. So I signed up for a trip that's conflict on one of those days. Okay, we can talk. It, that's okay. We can talk. And I scheduled it for February. I called her asking her if we could change. Well, I'm excited <laughs> for that. Um, and then just lastly, um, we are making some changes <coughs> in our hiking protocol. I have written those up, sent them to the city attorney. Depending on how this goes, this may be a similar protocol for softball and volleyball. And these are programs that generally happen away from the facility, but also have a degree of ability attached to them. Um, 
there's some expectations, even though in softball you can do different teams and in hikes we have different ratings, but um, really trying to explain, if you hike on your own, that's different than when you hike with a, a group. And so really trying to balance that experience. So that's, that's gone to the city attorney for review. And I have a few names uh, from the Get Acquainted, and you all haven't said whether you want to continue to make the Get Acquainted calls. This uh, Sheila and Prudence has been a thing. The board has done, we do Get Acquainted every month, and I usually bring the list to the board and one or two people sign up, and they just call as a board member. I'm an advisory board, I understand you came to Get Acquainted, did you have your questions answered, anything happened, just kind of a congenial, mm -hmm. informal follow-up. Um, so I have one, two, uh, three, four, five, six folks on the list. If anybody is interested in making those calls, um, I have names. So that's it for me. Sorry. I went long. Okay. And what do the people call in? No, you as a board member would call them and say, I understand you came to and get acquainted. I'm on the board. Any questions? Did it meet your needs? Yeah. Yeah, what was missing, what would you like, different, that kind of thing. And, and is that done in Spanish also? It can be if the person is a Spanish speaker. Okay. Yeah, I guess so Juana I'm, was doing it. Yeah. I guess what I'm saying, I, I, yeah. I, I would help with okay. the bilingual, then I mean with the Spanish speaker. And I can help in English? Like. Okay. Right. I mean, I can help with both, I'll but I mean the bilingual, but the Spanish speaker. I'll follow up with both of you. Okay, okay. thanks. Sorry, I took so long. So our... Susan, yes. Our governor chair. Okay. Uh, Marcia, do you have any reports that you want to share? Oh, let's see. Uh, we did claim an emergency, yes. and we um, and we did pub customer service. Um, so I'm thinking. Oh, and we did housing. Yep. So I, I think, no, I think, <laughs> I think all my stuff is covered. Well, can I, at this moment, just give Marsha and her colleagues a kudos. So Aaron Fosdick and I presented at the City Council retreat, and Mayor Bagley did make a suggestion to add to the vision for the City Council work plan uh, about supporting older adults through their entire lifespan. So. I thought that was fabulous. It uh, was a surprise and a really pleasant one. So um, I believe Sandy's working on bringing that back mm -hmm. to you all. And uh, just a huge thank you uh, yes, for that. Well, I, uh, uh, we are really trying to be the world's best village. And, and uh, um, you know, this organization is a big part of being the world's best village. So I'm glad to see it. In, recognized in the vision. Um, I wanted to ask, because I haven't, does anybody have any questions for me or for the council? Not at this time, and I, and I want to acknowledge you because I think we are well represented. Well, thank you. Um, AAC, Sarah? Yes. You have Through a report. series of unfortunate events, I did not attend the last meeting. <laughs> it was a bad snow day, and I locked my car keys in my car. Oh, <laughs> anyway, by the time I got AAA help, why it was too late. So, yeah, that's um, I think that the, as far as I can tell, without having seen the minutes in full, the only thing of important at the import at that meeting was a, a pro. A presentation about the census, and so I don't think I missed anything. But could I? Oh, um, the next meeting of AAA is this Friday, and it's at the Boulder County Parks and Open Space uh, building on St. Vrain Road, and the primary uh, topic will be orienting new members of the council um, about what the older Americans act is and why it's important <laughs> um, and how funding decisions are made by um, the, the AAA. Uh, so I've highlighted, this is the, the agenda for that meeting and since it's local here, it might be a good one if you'd like to learn more about what um, the council does, just drop in. I'll Great. pass that around. I highlighted the things that I thought might be most interesting. 
Um, can I have a copy of this? Sure. I might be able to attend, and uh, and I don't know where where that is, but okay. I can look it up. So okay, I'll um, make a copy. You won't drive your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Susan? Um, so the Friends has four new board members, so they were all kind of uh, get, getting their orientation for what goes on, committees that they could serve on. Um, Jane Cox, who handles the, well, you know, the investments was there, and she had been transferred to a new bank, so she's only overseen part of the money, most of the money, they are trying now to get all the money, including the checking account, over to Great Western, so all of the friends' money will be in one place. And while we were meeting, um, the resource specialist sent in a couple of requests for checks to be cut to help out some of the seniors. Mm -hmm. Great. So in a kind of an exciting way, uh, our new board members, uh, Rick Stewart, um, who was a former BIA driver, but also retired from a long-standing career here in the area, and he is currently pastor at Hygiene Uni United Methodist Church. Um, Chuck Allen, who many people would recognize Chuck's name, he's been in the banking world here in Longmont for many, many years. Dr. Roger Jurgens, who is a retired uh, orthodontist. Uh, a woman from Erie, um, actually Barbara Cousinitz, uh, who just thinks we have a great program and wanted to support the senior center. She may at some point be a peer counselor. She's a retired uh, licensed social worker. And Julie Burroughs, who's been on the boards uh, at various times. So it was really a great, yeah. uh, a great uh, new addition. I would say uh, when we look at the end of this year and we're looking at current uh, vacancies, Hopefully we can really look at the participation from some of our Latino community because uh, Uvaldo Valdez and Ed Nava both went off the board and so that would be uh, a missing piece on our friends board going forward uh, probably for 2021. But a good, good stable place. Gordon. It's, it's, it was sent to Jack, but so I assume it may be surveys. Sustainability. Yeah. Thank you. Um, TRG, Michelle is not with us today. Is there anyone else that has any information about, about that report? So I do know, and Marcia, maybe you know, they were looking at maybe reconfiguring or uh, uh, recommending maybe to council for some of the membership or application process for the technical review group. Has anything come back to council uh, about not that? Not yet. Okay. Um, so, so at I this point, you all already voted. Michelle's term ends March 31st, but you all already voted for her to continue, and I had told Kathy that. Um, so. That's all I know is there could be a change in how that gets determined, but I'm not 100% sure about that. So I'm not either. Okay. Um, Boulder County Latino Coalition. Uh, the only thing that, well, they talked a lot about the census there and encouraging uh, the seniors to, or not seniors, but everybody to, to get involved with the census. Uh, it's kind of interesting, Pete Salas gave a, a little overview on how the caucuses work. And I found it very interesting because even though I loved social studies and things like <laughs> that, uh, government, uh, there was a lot of review, uh, a lot of good information. And uh, I just found that interesting. But the uh, only other thing I had to offer on this is that uh, Cinco de Mayo celebration this year is going to be on the 2nd of May uh, because I think the 5th is on a what, Tuesday or whatever. And, and so Louis. Louis, Louis Lopez uh, presented on that, that, that uh, on the second they're going to be celebrating. And that's, that's such a great thing. And I don't know if we're going to do anything this year like we have in the past, but I just want to bring that up. Okay, great. 
Um, in addition to Cinco de Mayo in the park, the Latino Chamber of Commerce is going to be having a huge event here in the building. Um, and so kind of education and whatnot about Latino businesses in the area and a variety of things. On that same day. On that same okay. day. So right. a little bit added flavor for Cinco de Mayo. Perfect. Okay. Um, and before uh, we we're off the subject of the census too far, um, uh, the uh, nationwide survey came out that said that uh, half the people still think there's a citizenship question on the census, and there's not. So everybody needs to be sure to spread it around that there's not, and, and you won't be asked that question, and that it is against federal law to um, use your answers to the census to find out anything about you other than what's on the census. Are you the, the census or Spanish? Oh, just because, just? No. Oh, so, yeah. okay. oh, is that on the agenda? It is. Sorry. Oh, I'm it's sorry, okay. I didn't notice it. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I yeah. just figured out and mentioned it, so. Yeah. Whoops. My, uh, you don't want I've got a lot of pieces here. I, I dropped that Too one. Too much paper. For sorry. Sorry. <laughs> So wait, is this Don't your, is this one your blood copy? Or no. Nice it. Okay. I have a copy of that. Okay. Uh, LEDP is quarterly. I do believe uh, that we're going to be meeting this month. Yes. The whole thing is okay. quarterly. Um, but I do believe the whole thing meeting is this month, which would be next week. Uh, sustainability, Jack. I have, a, I have a question. Um, is what, what is the relationship, if any, between the sustainability group that Jack attends and the new task force that David is describing to us? That's a really great question. And I asked uh, Lisa from the sustainability to give me an organizational chart of all the committees because there's just transitions, there's a climate action staff task force, there's a climate uh, community task force, there's sustainability, there's quite a few different things going on. So I can't answer that question, maybe Marcia can, but I did ask for kind of a flow chart to, to help me sort of organize what meeting am I going to, what is it about, and um, and where are we going? Jack provided slides from uh, the recent sustainability coalition meeting and the minutes, um, as well as something, Marsha, I think you sent out uh, to me and others about some I information he had from the um, PRPA. Yes. And then, um, a, a blog that he had about why employee engagement is important. So, um, uh, as I said, I have not had a chance to review this material. I don't know if you have the elevator version I, of some of this. I can give you an elevator version of the relationship between the Climate Action Task Force and the standing city committees. The Climate Action Task Force grew out of the Climate Emergency Declaration it is being treated like a city commission, except that it's not permanent. Um, but it's subject to open meetings. Um, uh, Lisa Knobloch monitors it, but we hired a, uh, an independent facilitator from the CSU, well, you know, some, some agency within CSU that, that, um, that uh, works on facilitating working groups that are large like this one is. Um, and so their recommendations will go up through the sustainability board. There is a, uh, a review process that will happen and that's actually was documented uh, in the city council study session packet last night. So if anybody wants to look that up, um, I don't have it in, by memory what that process is, but it'll come to the city council first, the city council will vote to send it on, and then there'll be a comment period, essentially. Um, so that's the story. It is a public meeting, um, so they're posted in advance. It's not quite regular because 
it's a large group of people that have a, it's much larger than a standard board. And, and so uh, they're slightly irregular because people have to get to them. Um, so, uh, but that's a story. It's, it's supervised by sustainability in a loose sense, but it's boxed in. An advisory to council. Yes. Um, census, Sarah? Uh, yes, the papers that I passed around uh, were distributed at a class yesterday taught by the consumer um, specialist at the VA's office who did an excellent job of reviewing what the census um, is and is not and uh, particularly covering um, things that you should be aware of that might be scams or might be uh, misleading stuff. And the three pages that I passed around were handouts of that class, and then uh, I think they're excellent also. And she said that both materials from the Census Bureau and from the District Attorney's Office may be fully copied and distributed to anybody, so feel free to make copies of those and pass them on, and they have a Spanish version for the DA's thing. Have you seen that? You didn't have that one. Thank you. Um, that, uh, um, I think these are really helpful. So things are geared up considerably. We're now in the, the uh, mode of getting ready to answer questions. And I think about 40 people attended that class yesterday. And um, somebody towards the end said, well, this information ought to be available to everybody. You know, and how do we do that? So um, I, I think that um, the training that's going to happen, and I wanted to know more about that from you, about when and where. They're going to be training the tech people that are going to be here at the Senior Center to um, help people fill out the paper or computer uh, return questionnaire, I should say. Um, if you haven't seen the questionnaire yet, she had a sample at the meeting, and <coughs> it's going to be complicated, I think, for a lot of seniors who are not um, computer savvy like me. So, um, if, you know, basically, if you get the instruction sheet, which we will all get in the mail in about two weeks, it tells you exactly what you can do, what your options are, but the important thing is what you mentioned before is that the contact with the Census Bureau needs to be initiated by you. You get a call and somebody says, or somebody comes to your door and says they're doing such and such to help with the Census, that's not legit. Emails that might come also are uh, not legit. Um, Whatever you get, when you get that letter that explains the process and tells you what you need to do, that should be your guide. And I learned something, I never knew what a QR thing is. Oh, a QR code? Mm -hmm. Yeah, code. I never knew what that was, but that little box that uh -huh. will be on printed uh -huh. materials, one of the scams that's already coming out is that you'll get a postcard or something in the mail that says, you know, to tells you to scan that thing. Don't do that. Just do not respond to anything that is not in that letter that comes to you. If you have questions about, you know, something that's purports to be census related and you're not sure you should be uh, participating in that, call the DA's office or the other phone numbers that are suggested there, including the local census office here in Loma. Um, can I add a couple things? Sure. Um, Boulder County Air Agency and Aging did get some funds. They are high, They have hired uh, a person who's doing specified outreach to older adults in Boulder County around the census. Carmen Ramirez is doing the training for our computer tech volunteers this Friday at 930 Thank at you. Front Range. Carmen is also doing a very similar education session to the one Liz did in English yesterday. Carmen will be doing in Spanish. Don't have the date off the top of my head, but it's coming up very quickly. Um, 
We're also, um, the senior computer tech volunteers will be here on Monday mornings and Wednesday afternoons. We put that in the Go catalog. <coughs> so if somebody gets the letter and they want to come and do it on a computer, they don't necessarily want to do it at home, they want to make sure they go to the right site, blah, blah, blah. They can come here and the volunteers will help them get to the correct site and troubleshoot if they can't navigate the question. So um, we're being very cautious about calling it assistance because um, it's about the confidentiality. Um, but we're, we're working through that and um, after Friday, I think our volunteers will have a better sense of what that's going to look like for them. So uh, we're, we're moving that forward. We've asked Boulder County Air Agency on Aging to focus their worker, uh, his name's Stuart, um, to really look in at the homebound population throughout the county, uh, working with Meals on Wheels, Longmont, Boulder, and Coal Creek to try and figure that out. And Carmen and Aaron, who are city staff chairing the Longmont Census Committee, are going to be writing an article that will go in the Meals on Wheels newsletter uh, for those folks who are truly homebound, and we'll see what we can do to help them fulfill their, their obligation, because we certainly want to hear from them in terms of the census. We want to make sure we do that. So that's kind of a pickle right now is that homebound, more isolated mm -hmm. population. So we're Especially trying to figure... Especially the ones with no computer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're homebound for a reason and let's really try to do the outreach. So that's where kind of where we're headed with that. I was pleased to see that the Census Bureau is you know, they're doing this in steps and they're assuming that you know X number of the population will get the instructions and they'll go online and they'll do the computer thing or they'll call the 800 number and answer the questions over the phone and, and they'll, you know, that will take care of this percentage of the populace and then they'll move on to a reminder postcard. Did you forget to do this? You know, go ahead. And then there'll be a third mailing reminding them. And if still no response, they'll send you a paper questionnaire your address and if all of those things fail by June I guess they the people they're trying to hire right now will be coming and knocking on the door so it's a, to everybody's advantage to answer the first step if you can and get it over with so they don't bother you and it's like voting they did raise the pay rate <laughs> they did yeah. they did and actually I was I, I was at the same brain building and they said Woman they're recruiting, and someone asked her, and I happened to be right there. It's now 18.97 an hour. I was like, "Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's that's good." So, thank you. Sarah. I don't have anything further. That's but that I wanted you to all know that that training was excellent. That's good. We're not training, but educational meeting yesterday. So Liz Parker is who was here from the DA's office, and then El Comité also got a grant to do outreach and assistance for Spanish speakers, and so we'll be working with them also. So there's some good money out there to helping agencies really reach out to people harder to harder to serve, harder to reach folks. Okay. Uh, closing statements. Julie, do you have any? No. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Um, and I know this was a very long meeting, and thank everybody for staying over and a lot of information. So I'd like to hear a motion for adjournment. I motion to adjourn. Susan and Art, second. <laughs> thank you. Mark.